Welcome back to the 12 Days in March video podcast edition. This material was delivered as a live lecture at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this edition, we will focus on the key features of growth hormone that you will need to know for the USMLE Step 1 exam. A separate recording presents an interactive case highlighting the clinical presentation of a patient who recently presented with a growth hormone producing adenoma. Hormone, I played around with this subject and I think the way I choose to do this is just the seven facts you need to know about growth hormone. And here they are. All right, seven facts you need to know. Most important hormone for kids to achieve normal growth. Good, growth hormone. High levels during puberty. It is stimulated by sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone. So, and actually what happens, increased frequency of pulses and magnitude of pulses, estrogen pulses that ultimately increase growth hormone levels. So you need growth hormone for growth. Good, check. All righty. It's associated with both direct and indirect effects. And I think people are tuned to this, but if you're not, you need to be. So the growth hormone by itself has bodily effects, but the growth hormone also stimulates the somatomedins. It's a family of growth factors. So IGF, uh, insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1 stimulated by growth hormone. IGF-1 has separate and independent effects from growth hormone alone. So seven facts. Fact number two is growth hormone does things directly and through IGF-1. So the direct effects from growth hormone include, and again, this is what growth hormone is about, protein sparing. So increased protein synthesis, increased muscle mass, increased amino acid uptake. That's what growth hormone wants to do. It wants to grow muscle. It uh, stimulates lipolysis. That's good. I don't mind getting rid of some fat. So it stimulates lipolysis, and it also is involved, stimulates gluconeogenesis, and it also antagonizes insulin. So hyperglycemia is a consequence of excess growth hormone secretion. All right. So we said, so the direct effects just reiterated, increased protein synthesis. The lipolysis, again, is to spare proteins. You're breaking down fat so you don't have to break down proteins. We're trying to create muscle mass here. Stress hormone, the goal was to increase glucose availability, and it did it by gluconeogenesis and antagonizing insulin. And the other direct effect, again, it stimulates IGF-1, and we'll talk about IGF-1. All right, so here's just a picture of Andre and the direct effects of growth hormone. We just said those. Muscle, IGF-1, insulin antagonism, enhances lipolysis to protect muscle. So here's the non-direct uh, effect. This is what comes from IGF. But IGF stimulates both the chondrocyte for linear growth, and when you're adults, when you've fused the growth place and you can't stimulate the chondroblast anymore, you can stimulate the osteoblast, especially on flat bone. So a young patient with growth plates that are still open will have increased linear growth from the effect of IGF-1 and actually growth hormone stimulating chondrocyte 2. But once a growth plate four closes, all you get is lateral bone growth by stimulating osteoblast. Okay, so that's uh, number one with IGF. The other issue is the visceral effects. So the skin thickens, the tongue grows, connective tissue thickens, cardiomyopathy, organomegaly, all the organs increase in size, but especially the heart. And uh, that's relevant because that's what my boy Andre the Giant died from. This is actually untreated. This is what patients with growth hormone adenomas die from. They die from uh, cardiomyopathy, it's a dilated cardiomyopathy. So summarizing the indirect effects of uh, IGF1, uh, free growth plate uh, closure, mitogenic effect on chondrocytes, linear growth, those are, that's a giant, that's gigantism. Post growth place, acromegaly, you get lateral bone growth, hands, feet, jaw in particular, and we already talked about the metabolic visceral effects. High growth hormone and IGF, diabetes, cardiomyopathy, hypertension, macroglossia, etc. So here's growth plate, here's the ossification center, and this is where the chondrocytes live. And we already said growth hormone and IGF stimulator effect longitudinal growth. This is the site of action in the growth plate on the chondrocytes. All right. And with parathyroid, I think I showed you this, growth hormone I'm showing this to you. When I do musculoskeletal bone formation, I'll show it again. But just remember, again, the growth hormone is active in the proliferative zone where the chondrocytes are. Parathyroid stimulates osteoblasts in the ossification center. So where you're already getting breakdown of cartilage, cartilage spicules, osteoblasts are laying down bone, woven bone in the ossification center. 
PTH versus growth hormone, where they work. All right, we're running out of things you need to know about growth hormone. Diagnostically, we don't actually get growth hormone levels. We get IGF levels, IGF-1 levels. Okay, that's better. And the reason we do that, our growth hormone uh, secretion is cyclical, so you may not be catching the levels appropriately. The other thing you can do with growth hormone is give a oral glucose load to suppress it. I'm sure that's done, but less commonly. They may, I, I don't even see that on the boards. I've never seen it in the few banks. But if they give an oral glucose, so in that instance, you can have a high growth hormone level. You give oral glucose, it doesn't suppress. So you already have signs of growth hormone excess. Or is it death, cardiomyopathy? Treatment. So when they do growth hormone, if I'm going to see anything, I'm going to see the discussions on treatment. Okay. So octreotide, somatostatin, you know, of somatostatin fame that cut, uh, decreases a response to uh, GI hormones. It also is used uh, for growth hormones. So somatostatin decreases growth hormone levels. And the drug that uses octreotide, I don't think that's real popular among students. So when I go through the Q banks, people don't recognize octreotide as somatostatin and use for these neuroendocrine excesses, in this instance, growth hormone. There is a growth hormone receptor antagonist, pegvisamont, okay? And you're going to have to be aware of that for reasons I'll show you in a second. And I already mentioned, just like with a prolactinoma, transphenoil, hypophysectomy, so you can take out the uh, adenoma. Um, but remember, just... If you give octreotide, you are suppressing growth hormone levels, okay? So this is, that, that's easy to envision. If you give pegvisamont, which is a receptor antagonist, what happens to growth hormone levels? Right, you all got it right. The growth hormone level doesn't come down. It doesn't go up because it's already autonomous secretion. But if they ask that, the growth horm you, you're affecting the growth hormone receptor. So the growth hormone level doesn't change. This is a receptor antagonist. What happens with the IGF-1 levels? Okay, right, the IGF level can go down because growth hormone is stimulating the production at the level of the liver. So you're blocking the stimulation. So IGF levels can go down, but growth hormone levels can stay elevated. Uh, I think we'll cover that. I think I have questions at the end. And that concludes this podcast on growth hormone secreting adenomas. Be sure to view the follow-up question-based podcast reviewing the clinical presentation of a patient with acromegaly and the key USMLE derivatives. Thank you.